Sonder from the Wilmer Eye Institute at Johns Hopkins. Welcome, Professor. Well, thank you. I appreciate giving the opportunity to, to, to talk. Tell us a little bit about the scope of the work that you conduct uh, in your laboratory and clinically. So um, laboratory-wise, we've been spending the last really two decades looking at the molecular signals that distinguish chronological aging from early age-related macular degeneration. And what we're trying to do is, under, we focused on looking at the role of oxidative stress, um, activating innate immunity, which can uh, result in some of the phenotypes that we see in our patients, um, but also explain why patients lose vision early on in the disease. And that enables us to look at our, uh, to provide some explanations for why patients uh, who may have 20-20 vision with early macular degeneration um, yet say they're blind. Um, so we're trying to, to make that connection, uh, identify treatment targets that would be safe uh, and valuable for people early on in the disease. And our sort of strategy is that when, if you can delay the onset of more advanced disease by five or 10 years, you'll probably win the game um, because people are at the end stage of their lives and we can improve the quality of their lives uh, as, they, as they get older. So what's new for Arvo 2017? Well, I think um, <clears throat> in general, um, uh, the things that excite me in the, in the AMD world is uh, the impact that mitochondrial dysfunction is having. And that's a, a role that uh, our laboratory has gotten into. Uh, so we're, we're actually very excited about that. Um, what I mean by that is um, when we have, our lab in particular has studied the role of oxidative stress, we've focused on looking at the cytoprotective pathways such as NRF2, which is this uh, um, powerful, um, broad, um, antioxidant uh, transcription factor that unleashes uh, a, a large number of uh, protective enzymes. And when we uh, impaired the NRF2 response, which we have seen, we have evidence of that in our AMD samples from people, uh, we found that the role of oxidative stress when the cells are stressed doesn't dramatically increase as we had expected. And when we've gone back and looked at our work, we find that NRF2 also controls um, the function of the mitochondria. And um, what we found is that the ability to produce the substrates to make ATP are uh, reduced. And so our working model is that the mitochondria are um, kind of going into safe mode where they reduce the amount of ATP that's produced. Uh, they, pr their uh, other aspects, the functioning, still is functional but slowed down. The consequence of that is we don't see as much oxidative stress produced from the mitochondria and therefore we're not measuring it as much. So that's prompted us to look at um, the impact that mitochondrial dysfunction is having on the overall functioning, not only of the RPE cell, but also of uh, the photoreceptors and the impact it could have in explaining uh, early vision loss. So what have been uh, the most interesting insights for you in this particular line of research? Um, well, I think the fact that NRF2 in itself has been uh, identified to be um, only antioxidant or predominantly antioxidant protection and the impact it has on uh, the mitochondria in particular, uh, it, it can control the expression of a number of genes in the, in the TCA cycle, um, which is obviously important to helping uh, uh, generate NADH and substrate for um, oxidative phosphorylation. Um, in addition, NRF2 can regulates a number of genes involved in glycolysis, and um, uh, so the ability of the cell to make ATP can be dramatically impaired. We have some evidence showing that when we reduce NRF2, uh, the ATP levels, the oxidative phosphorylation, oxygen consumption, overall mitochondrial function goes down, and that can have an impact on a number of uh, factors. We have looked at the role of autophagy, getting rid of some of the, the debris within the cell becomes impaired. Other groups have shown that impaired autophagy uh, is, um, uh, occurs in uh, human AMD disease, uh, so that's one possibility. The other area that uh, is a, a little bit unusual uh, that we are looking at is that when the RPE cell 
uh, reduces its ability to make ATP and goes toward glycolysis, the, uh, uh, the impact is that the RP cell can still probably survive um, because it has enough glucose uh, that it's uh, receiving from the chorio capillaris. Uh, however, um, if it's going to need to consume more glucose, uh, glucose is very important for photoreceptors. The photoreceptors aren't getting as much glucose as they need. They become uh, impaired. Um, and we think that's important because that might explain some of the visual complaints that patients who may be 20-20 and still have relatively healthy looking maculas um, might have other symptoms that tell it, that make them believe that they're going blind. And um, I think the explanation that we're pursuing is that um, in the macula, the, uh, the parafovia is uh, predominantly rod driven, uh, rod uh, de high density of rods. And the rods are probably affected um, early on because they don't uh, contain as much mitochondria. They have other other sort of um, designs that aren't uh, that make them a little bit more vulnerable than the cones. Mm -hmm. And with patients, uh, basically the patient complaints are due to reduced uh, light sensitivity. So if light is going into the eye, they're only perceiving uh, a reduced amount, and so they always feel like they need to get more light to see clearly. And I think that can explain if, um, if the photoreceptors aren't, and the rods in particular, aren't getting enough glucose, um, their light sensitivity um, becomes blunted mm -hmm. and the patient becomes symptomatic. Now, how do you balance that with individuals who get too much glucose, such as in diabetes? Yeah, um, it's uh, uh, obviously a, 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 a quite a different pathway, and since the blood vessels get impaired, early on and hypoxia becomes a, a big driving factor. I think um, the whole constellation of different pathways that get activated um, are, are, um, are different and have a different impact on, on the cells. But I do think that there are potentially some over, overlapping uh, concepts, um, although one of the anatomic differences is that um, the high glucose levels tend to damage the blood vessels within the retina which nourishes and has an impact on the inner retina, and we've been looking predominantly at the outer retina, uh, which yeah. could become impaired. Interesting. So if you look at the inflammatory ecosystem, then, um, are you developing or using this knowledge to develop a, a, a more finely granular impression of how these factors interact? I mean, traditionally, we used to think about superoxide dismutase and that pathway. How, how does your particular perception change the ecosystem that we uh, thought we knew about? Yeah, um, one of the avenues we're pursuing that is uh, unique is most people first off consider oxidative stress or reactive oxygen species as inherently bad. And um, certainly uh, hydrogen peroxide, other free radicals are critical for cell signaling during normal homeostasis of the cell. So it becomes a, a matter of um, whether there's too much or too little uh, free radicals. And if you have an excess and you're unable to appropriately neutralize it, um, then you could have um, tissue injury. The other thing that we've uh, identified and found is that the, um, there's some unique signaling of uh, hydrogen peroxide or free radicals that changes our perception of just oxidative stress in general. Uh, and it's somewhat the location of it. So when we see oxygen free radicals being formed in the mitochondria, we think that that is not necessarily bad, but it serves as a signaling trigger to uh, um, go to the nucleus to unleash some cytoprotective response. Mm -hmm. So the mitochondrial dysfunction producing excess superoxide anions can then signal um, send signals to the um, nucleus to, to elicit a, a cytoprotective response. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a protective response, and if, uh, but if there's too much of it, there obviously can be tissue injury, um, but at an appropriate level it serves as a protective signaling response. I think that's important to recognize because um, if we um, try to develop too strong of an antioxidant treatment, we may be impairing that response. The cell may not be able to respond appropriately. So we have to have, like everything, the right balance 
uh, in our, uh, in our uh, therapeutic strategy. I guess the term I like to use is rejuvenation. Right. So given all this uh, work that you're doing, what are the translational implications in your mind? Um, I think that uh, with some of the signaling pathways we've identified, um, I, I think they become viable targets. Um, we're looking at um, some of the pathways and links of inflammation and the impact it may have on the visual cycle, which can have a direct Im um, implication on, um, on vision. Uh, and with some of the targets, we could have some definable endpoints that could be translated. In addition, we have some collaborations with people who, are, um, uh, who have uh, nanoparticles and other small molecules that we can uh, not only have sustained release, because that's a, an important component, but also um, have uh, targeted to specific either cell types or um, subcellular organelles. Uh, and I think if we get to that specificity, we could be very efficient and effective in our treatment, reduce the side effects because we can deliver the drug only where we need it and not have unintended uh, consequences in other areas uh, of the body. And these would be uh, intravitreally delivered or some other delivery mechanism? The simplest uh, approach would be giving an intravitreal because the, just the, the sheer amount. But the capability is certainly there uh, if you have something so specific uh, that you could deliver it through a, through a pill form or through uh, a shot, a long, a long acting shot or things like that. But most of our thoughts of proof of concept at the beginning would be intravitreal injections. As you look at the future, what are your expected deliverables in a year from now <laughs> and in five years from now, if everything goes well? Well, if, if, if some of our work becomes, uh, uh, if we can validate some of our findings in uh, several animal models of, of AMD, then I think the next stage would be to um, uh, see if we can develop uh, small molecules working with uh, um, um, big pharma to have perhaps to have this uh, some sort of marriage the, and do things that we're not capable of doing. But um, I think our role is to identify the targets with the hope that somebody can develop uh, a treatment. Um, mm -hmm. And if that can occur because of the rich environment I'm in at Johns Hopkins, we have um, the capability of implementing uh, from phase one to phase three uh, clinical trials and be part of that. So to me, it'd be very exciting to see some of the molecules and the pathways that we've been studying for a couple of decades could be translated into a clinical trial. I, I think that's what all of us are really here uh, in, the, in the business for. Professor, tell us about any of the other projects that you're working on that have particularly interest and potential. Yeah, um, again, the, the theme has been uh, mitochondria. We recently received a grant from the Bright Focus uh, Foundation where We've been, I've been working with a collaborator, uh, Mike Pilatus, who's been a, a cancer researcher, and we have been looking at the role of microRNAs that can influence the mitochondria mm -hmm. that uh, are packaged into exosomes and released um, by RPE cells. So um, the idea that we, we've identified a few microRNAs that when we inhibit the production of the microRNAs, they actually restore mitochondrial function. And uh, what we're excited about is because we've identified those microRNAs in exosomes, we believe that the exosomes can be a vehicle to uh, uh, have cell-to-cell -cell communication, whether it is the sort of growing area of geographic enlargement, atrophy enlargement, or um, to explain why some RPE cells are very susceptible to injury and while others are quite resistant to the harsh environment that the macula may be living in, uh, we think that exosomes uh, allow a really interesting uh, form of cell-to-cell -cell communication. And why we think it's particularly important with microRNAs is that when it's microRNAs is packaged in an exosome, it's resistant to the nucleases. So if it's just released, it's not going to be degraded. So it's a way to actually get the material in the cell to have an effect have an effect on the cell. Professor, thank you so much for sharing this great work with us and we look forward to following and hearing more good results in the future. Well, thank you for the opportunity and, uh, and hopefully we can deliver on our, our, on our projects. Thank you again.